If you should have a prayer request that you that is of a substantive nature and you would like added uh, to either category that's on page six, just let me know, and I'll seek to add that uh, to the list. Please turn at this time in the Heidelberg Catechism to uh, question and answer, uh, or rather Lord's Day, rather number fifty-one, which is question and answer one twenty-six. Uh, that's on page. Uh, 895, at the back of your hymnal. We've been working our way through the Lord's Prayer. The Lord's Prayer is composed, constructed of six petitions, and we are now arriving today at the fifth petition. What does the fifth petition mean? Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors means because of Christ's blood, do not impute to us poor sinners that we are any of the transgressions we do or the evil that constantly clings to us. Forgive us just as we are fully determined as evidence of your grace in us wholeheartedly to forgive our neighbors. Amen. If you have your Bibles, please turn to Matthew chapter 18. What we read about in, uh, by way of the fifth petition, we now uh, will read a parable having to do with that very petition. It's called the parable of the unforgiving servant in the ESV. Matthew 18, verse 21. Peter came up and said to him, Lord, how often... Will my brother sin against me and I forgive him? As many as seven times? Jesus said to him, I do not say to you seven times, but seventy-seven times. Therefore the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his servants. When he began to settle, one was brought to him who owed him ten thousand talents. And since he could not pay... His master had ordered him to be sold with his wife and children and all that he had and payment to be made. So the servant fell on his knees, imploring him, Have patience with me, and I will pay you everything. And out of pity for him, the master of that servant released him and forgave him the debt. And when that same servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii, and seizing him, he began to choke him, saying, Pay what you owe. So his fellow servant fell down and pleaded with him, Have patience with me, and I will pay you. He refused, and went and put him in prison until he should pay the debt. When his fellow servants saw what had taken place, they were greatly distressed, and they went and reported to their master all that had taken place. Then his master summoned him and said to him, You wicked servant, I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me. And should not you have had mercy on your fellow servant as I had mercy on you? And in his anger his master delivered him to the jailers, or the tormentors, if you notice the alternate reading, which is actually more correct delivered him to the tormentors until he should pay all his debt. So also my heavenly Father will do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother from the heart. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, how we thank you this morning that forgiveness has come into our world's history, into our own age, the pounding of cross of Christ into the ground that mankind might forever know that there is forgiveness to be sought with God through Christ. We pray, Heavenly Father, this morning that you would illumine our minds in this great truth of the forgiveness of our debts as we forgive our debtors and grant us, Lord, to not only to receive it, but, Lord, to grant it. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, it's pretty evident why we need the petition, give us this day our daily bread. We're hungry. 
And it also should be evident why we need this other prayer. Forgive us our debts. We are sinful. We sin against God. We sin against each other. And because of this, we find that our relationships with God and with man to be carried out under a bit of a dark cloud. A kind of floating guilt uh, eats away at our confidence. We secretly fear, I'm going to be found out. We become edgy, we become defensive, we become combative, or we become withdrawn and sullen. We know we have failed in a myriad of ways, and we also, even as we look at our successes, uh, they too become accompanied with regrets. I shouldn't have gloated over my victory. I should have congratulated the other person or given credit to the other. So no matter how we cut it, we need this prayer. If we have indeed become conscious of who God is in His holiness, if we have indeed become conscious reflexively of the web of sin that is still at work in our hearts and lives, we need this prayer. Because without it, we will sink into the depths and we will remain there unless we are able to pray this prayer. This prayer is the key of the misery of Doubting Castle. We need to ask God, as Psalm 51 tells us, against you and you only have I sinned for forgiveness while confessing our sins to Him, and then resting in His promise. Our debt is great, it increases daily, and so we pray, forgive us our debts. Here's the oil for the frozen tin man. Here's the help in the slough of despond. Here's the sun after the storm, the forgiveness of of sins. And yet, Jesus here informs us that horizontal forgiveness works in tandem with vertical forgiveness. They go together. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. So let us remember as we look into this fifth petition of the one who actually penned it, not spoke it, but penned it, Matthew. Remember Matthew, a tax collector. Uh, Here is a man who, uh, you might say, uh, spent much of his life tightening the screws on debtors. He understood the economics of life. He understood that we need to pay what we owed responsibly. He understood of what it was like to be unable to pay what is owed and its misery. So, we owe God our lives, for He sustains them. We owe our obedience to God, for He is our Creator. And when we fail to pay what we owe, by either sins of commission or sins of omission, we get behind in our payments, we fall into debt. Now, in Luke 11, where this same prayer is recorded by Luke, it's not forgive us our debts, as in Matthew, but it's forgive us our sins. And that confirms the nature of the debt in Matthew. It's our sins, piled high and deep. This word for debt uh, that Matthew uh, employs, forgive us our debts, Uh, is also used by Paul in Romans uh, chapter 4, verse 4. But Paul turns it on its head. Paul says, To the one who works, his wages are not counted as a gift, but as his due. Same word, as a debt. But notice how Paul's using it. Paul, you see, is using it from the perspective of a covenant of works. And he's saying that if you do the work, God is indebted to you to pay you for the work that you have done according to his covenant arrangement. A payment of a verdict of righteousness. You've done what I've asked. 
and of eternal life as a reward for it. Amazing that Paul uses it in this way. God being in debt to us. If, and that is a big if, <laughs> if we perfectly obey him. Because see, in reality, we have not. We have failed. And this God is not in debt to us. <laughs> we are in deep debt to him. And we cannot pay. And that's the point of the parable, isn't it? In Matthew chapter 18. The debtor owed 10,000 talents. Now, um, what is a talent? A talent's about 75 pounds, generally of silver. About 75 pounds of silver in that day, for an average laborer, was about 20 years of work. Do the math. That is 200,000 years worth of work to pay back. That's what he owed. What's the point of this? It's a parable. I highly doubt anybody was in that deep. But the point is, there's an enormous, unpayable debt that he has before his master or king. And thus, his, re his response, make me a slave. Chain me to the mill to grind out bread and along with my family until I die. So when we pray, forgive us our debts, we must not just stop there. We must, we must get something clear in our minds. And it's very important that we get it clear in our minds. When we're praying that prayer, Lord, Father, forgive us our debts. Two questions in getting this straight. First, is this a prayer for forensic forgiveness or for family forgiveness? Second, is this prayer grounded in what? Is it grounded in seeking to pull the heartstrings of, of, of God's pity so he'll finally concede, like the, like the king here conceded, and because, you know, because of your pleading, I had pity on you? Is that the grounds for God forgiving? Uh, just lots of pleading, lots of hair shirts of depression? Uh, those are two very important questions with regard to this prayer. So let's begin with the first one. Is this a prayer that is for forensic or family forgiveness? And we need to be clear on this point because we are redeemed by faith in Jesus Christ and we have 100% complete forgiveness of all our sins before God's tribunal of justice. Ephesians 1.7, we have redemption through His blood, i.e., the forgiveness of of our sins. 1 John chapter 4.10 Herein is love, not that we love God, but He loved us and sent Christ as a propitiation for our sins. Again in Romans chapter 3, we read that through the blood of Christ there is propitiation for our sins. What is the point? The point is this. Christ legally, forensically settled justice on the cross for your sins if you were a believer in Jesus Christ. That's what propitiation means. Wrath satisfied. Justice served. Uh, no coming back. Now that propitiatory death of Jesus, as the scriptures inform us, is driven by what? The love of God. The love of God for sinners. The love of God for whom His wrath is hanging over them. He loves them. He wishes to redeem them. He wishes to forgive them. And Christ's cross is the grounds for it. Now that cross of Christ in propitiating our sins, serving justice, is the forensic ground for forgiveness. That's what Christ accomplished. For you and for me. Once and for all. Now what Christ has accomplished is then applied to you and me when we trust in Jesus. When you come and place your faith in Christ, you are justified by faith. The Apostle Paul so wondrously puts it. And to be justified by faith in Christ means number one, we are forgiven 
for the debt that we owe God forever. It is finished, is entered on our books. And secondly, justification by faith also means not only that our debt is paid, but the price for entering heaven has also been paid. It's not just that we've cleared the books and we're at zero, but it means an actual righteousness to purchase the richness of heaven is also applied to your book. You've bought and paid for heaven by faith in Christ. I'm forgiven, my debt is gone, I'm enriched, Heaven's gates are open wide. By faith in Christ, the forensic, legal demands, the justice of God, fully served by Christ for you and for me. He clears our debt. He purchases life for us. And that is the grounds, brothers and sisters, for your forgiveness. If you want to put it in economic terms to try to bring it home even more specifically, if I want to purchase something that cost a million dollars, but I'm a million dollars in debt, how far am I away from that purchase? Do the math. Anybody can tell me? Two million. That's right. So Christ removes the debt. But he also puts a million in your account for the purchase price. His obedience is both an obedience that bears the curse, but it also is an obedience that secures the required righteousness in our behalf. This is forensic. This is legal. This is court term, solid terminology. And if you have received Christ, you have not only been relieved of your debt and imputed with his perfect righteousness for life, but you've been what? Reconciled to the Father. In other words, God has changed from the demanding judge to the receiving Father of his children in heaven. Wonder of wonders. So we must be clear in our minds and in our hearts. Forensic righteousness is 100% Forensic forgiveness is 100% settled by Christ's obedience to the cross if you have received it by faith alone. Now, in the Lord's Prayer, as we read the Lord's Prayer, we are moving from God as judge legally to God as father parentally. In other words, this prayer for forgiveness in the Lord's Prayer is prayer to who? Our Father. That's the covenantal, rich covenantal relationship that we have, ratified by Christ. So when we pray, Father, please forgive my sins. This is not a prayer for legal forgiveness from our judge. It is a prayer for parental forgiveness from our Father. And we, as sons, family members, loved of our Father, ask for it. Now this same distinction can be carried over from last week's sermon on John 13. Remember, Jesus said to them, you're already clean. There it is, legal justification. However, what? Your feet still need to be washed. There's the the life walk before God. The feet still get dirty. There's the question of not justification, but sanctification. Not a clearing us before the bar of judgment, but purifying our hearts before a holy Father. Now, some people have suggested, actually, that we don't need to confess our sins because Christ died for them. Why keep bringing them up and confessing them? I don't know if you've heard that argument before, but it is one that has been offered and uh, people have adopted. This is partially right. And a partial truth fostered as a whole truth is an untruth. (laughs) It is partially right because we do not need to ask God to forgive me legally before the bar of justice. But it is also 
not only partially right, it is also wrong. Because I still have a relationship with my Father in heaven in the realm of sanctification and growing purity and walking close to Him in fellowship that calls for my ongoing confession of sin. 1 John chapter 1, I think, makes this perfectly clear when it's talking about our fellowship with the Father and the need to confess our sins. So that what? So that nearer, still nearer, I can grow, I can ripen, I can mature, I can progress in sanctification. And thus, 1 John tells us that, hey, if you, if you, if you, if you, even as a believer, if you don't want to be honest about your sins, you're involved in self-deception. You're involved in a lie, which is contrary to having fellowship with God in this life. Now, the grounds and the power for forgiveness as a child of God is the same. It's still the blood of Christ applied. We read that right there in Hebrews 10, remember, in the call to worship. Hearts, conscience, sprinkled clean by the blood of Jesus. That's applied. Though we never stop praying, forgive us our debts, forgive us our sins, in our family relationship as sons to the Father. And we should never stop looking to the cross as the grounds, the ongoing grounds and application of that forgiveness. But the prayer has a second related component, doesn't it? Forgive us our sins what, as we forgive our debtors. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. So let's be informed. Let's our hearts be reformed by this single one torpedo from the parable in Matthew 18. One big torpedo there, headed right to you and toward me. That once having been relieved by God's forgiveness toward us, that raises us out of the depths of hell and brings us to the richness of heaven, once we have been forgiven of our debt. That is a motive to move us to deeply forgive others for their smaller debts. Now, it is significant in the parable you have an enormous unpayable debt versus another debt that's payable, but it's nonetheless a debt. It's not like you said, hey, you know, look how much God has forgiven you. All other debts are trivial. That's, that's not the point. The debts that impact you are not trivial to you, right? Yet, they need to be forgiven. And so Matthew 18, as we read it, sets before us this ghastly incongruity. How can you, who have been give, forgiven so much, not in turn, forgive a little by comparison. The fellow servants, upon observing this pay me back or else forgiven servant, were aghast. But the master was outraged. See, the cross of Jesus means I am loved and forgiven by way of a great sacrifice. And there is consequently a great and grievous disconnect if I do not translate that same reception of grace toward others. Again, uh, John 13, as Jesus says, If I have washed your feet, what? You also ought to wash one another's. The same cross that draws us near to God is meant by application to draw us to each other with humble hearts because of our sins, because of our lack of love. And it should call us to keep coming back to God. To keep coming back to God and to each other. 
to confess our sins, to ask for forgiveness, to give forgiveness. And consequently, it's this dynamic that enables us to pull together and not pull apart. How wrong it is to walk away from the church because you are offended. How wrong. What a denial of the cross that is. Do we really, truly know anything about our sins and of God's deep forgiveness in Jesus Christ if we separate from God's people because we are offended and unwilling to reconcile? It's instructive to note that after the Lord's Prayer, after Jesus taught his disciples how to pray with the six petitions of the Lord's Prayer, he only commented upon one of those petitions. And the only petition he commented on was the one asking for forgiveness. And Jesus says, look, bottom line, don't expect your Father in heaven to be forgiving toward you if you are unforgiving toward each other. Hardcore. Matter of fact, without hoping to run too far with the parable of Matthew 18, the Father may just turn you over to a torturing of conscience and mind and heart in your life for an unwillingness to forgive and be reconciled. Now, I don't suggest in any way that we should proceed as a church without rebuke and correction. Remember, Jesus said, if your brother sins, rebuke him. I, I, I don't mean to suggest that we should, uh, you know, shut off all discussion over how to resolve a problem by plastering on some fake face of forgiveness. It may take concentrated effort to reach a point of settled forgiveness and reconciliation, one with another. As Paul says, speaking the truth in love. Speaking the truth in love goes with granting and giving and asking for forgiveness. They're not, one doesn't shut down the other. But as members of the family of God, through many dangers, through many toils, through many snares, let us always keep our eye on the overwhelming river that flows into the church through the gospel. The river of the refreshing streams of God's love in granting ongoing forgiveness in our lives together. And let us not turn the spigot off to each other. Let's not turn that spigot off and saying, well, I've received the forgiveness, but I really don't want to talk about how I've been hurt. But rather, let's rally around the cross of Jesus together as his people broken and contrite in spirit, as Psalm 51 speaks of. Transparent in heart, confessing our sins, receiving forgiveness, delighting in forgiveness, and remembering also, as Jesus says, to also give it and to ask for it from each other. I close with 1 John 4, 10 and 11. In this is love. Not that we love God, but he loved us and sent his Son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. Let us pray.